What do you think, uh, what mental status or processes mediate between perception and action? Yeah, so, um, so I wrote a book about this um, seven years ago. It's called Between Perception and Action. Um, and in, in, um, in, a, in a similar vein that I, I explained before, I think that perception is really important here. So the idea is this, you, um, you see something, I don't know, you see your, your laptop's camera and then you touch it. Um, what, what are the mental processes that are required here? And the classic, in a classic picture, you kind of bring in the whole arsenal of everything that, uh, that happens in the mind. So you have a perceptual state, because of that you form a belief that this is where the camera is. You have a desire to touch the camera. You form an intention to touch the camera. Then you touch the camera. So I think that, that, is, exact, that is the way that some of our actions work, like right? really complicated actions, but most of our actions, they don't work that way. Most of our actions, you just have a uh, perceptual input and then you form this kind of action guiding representations that I call pragmatic representations and that guides you to do it and that's it you don't you don't need anything else you don't need a belief you don't need a desire you you just need you, you just need this kind of one special kind of rep representation that I call pragmatic representation and that's the uh that's the way most of our actions are um um work so I've been um, I've been messing my, my hair because I just washed it I did not. I did not once had a belief or a desire about messing with my hair. I just, uh, I just did it because of because of the. But if this is goal directed action. I was knowing exactly where I'm where I'm putting my hand and so on. Uh, but I, uh, this is a bona fide actions that are perceptually guided actions, but they're not mediated by all these very complicated mental states. So that's the phenomenon that I was trying to capture in in the book. These kind of uh, simpler actions that really make up much of our uh, daily life. How they uh, how they are triggered by perception. Okay, why not hope that the perceptual state remains unchanged while the relationship between and the states and process involved in motor planning and execution of that? Say this again. Why why not think that the perception remains the same when perceptual what? state remains unchanged while the relationship between between it and the states and process involved in um, motor planning and execution of that. Um, why not think that the perceptual state remains the same and, uh, when you're performing an action? Or is this, is this written down somewhere? Yeah. Know. Yeah, that's the question. Um, Oh, 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 I see. So wh why not think that the perceptual state is the same and you get us of what, so is it about how you're performing two different actions and then the perceptual state is different when you do this? Um, is that a question? So let me, let me just ask the next one. I think that's an inter interesting question. I'm not yeah, sure yeah. But, um, mm -hmm. So is the question about the, the, the glass of water, right? So, so you have a, a glass of water and then in one scenario, you're thirsty, so you're not okay. And the other scenario, you are, you're not thirsty but you want to uh, water your plant or you're really angry at someone and you just want to throw the water in their face. So, I, I, and I want to say that the perceptual state is going to be different. And part of the reason why it's going to be different is that you're going to focus on very different properties of this glass of water. So if you want to drink it, then what you're going to focus on is, uh, you know, what's inside, whether this is water from that you, you know, from tap water or I don't know how, how much. And you're going to, even, even the way you're going to approach it with, the kind of the grip size that you're going to approach it with and, and the movement that, you, that you're going to uh, want to perform with it is going to be very different. So um, the, you're going to attend to different features of this. Uh, so here's another example that I used somewhere. Uh, so phone, so if you get, you're looking at your phone and depending on what you want to do with it, whether you want to call a cab or what you want to hammer in a nail, you're going to focus on very different features of the phone. If you want to uh, hammer in a nail, that's gonna, you're gonna focus on some aspect of it, or you're gonna attend to certain properties of it. If you want to call a cab, you're gonna attend to, to other features of it. And we also know from uh, millions of uh, empirical studies that attention very much influences uh, your experience. So if you're, if you're attending to different features of the same object, you're going to experience it very differently. Which is also, this is, this is probably something that I should have said earlier when we were talking about how we, 
people experience the same things differently. Part of the reason for that is because they're attending it to a different, they're attending to different parts of a different features of it. So the experience is going to be different. Thank you, Professor. And how the non-conscious perceptual state that guides adapted action is updated through the uh, perceptual learning and why there is a mismatch between the conscious and non-conscious perceptual uh, representation in cases of action re uh, resistant illusion. Ah, uh, this is from the book. Um, well, um, so first of all, I should say something about the whole un unconscious mental states and unconscious perceptual states. There's been a lot of research on how perception can be conscious or unconscious. Um, and um, it's, 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 it's something that can be studied experimentally uh, quite easily. Uh, you flash a certain stimulus for a very short period of time. So I'm normally under, on, under 200 milliseconds and it's not long enough so that it would, you would not know that it happened. Nonetheless, it influences your action. So again, it can prime you to do things. So you, if you flash the word duck, uh, then you don't, you don't know that it's, it was flashed, but you, nonetheless, you're going to be quicker finding ducks in your country. So, uh, so that, that's unconscious perception. So the, the stuff that you're referring to, the stuff that you're, um, you were um, asking about is an argument that I make in this book, in my first book called Between Perception and Action, about why these mental states that mediate between perception and action, they must be perceptual states, these things that are called pragmatic representations. So the pragmatic representations are these representations that, that, uh, that represents the object as having the properties that are required for you to, uh, to perform the action. So if I, uh, if I wanna take out my pen, I can't do that without representing it as having a certain weight. If I didn't know what kind of weight it has, I wouldn't know what, what force to exert in order to lift it. I have to represent this as having a certain size. If I didn't know what size it had, then I wouldn't know uh, how, what kind of grip size I should approach it with and so on. So, um, so these are the representations that I think are definitely the, they are the immediate mental antecedents of action. So they are the kind of representations that are absolutely required to perform any kind of action. And I make this extra claim about this, this in these mental states, namely that they are perceptual states. So, so I kind of want to sh short circuit the link between perception and action. So here's, per no, here's perception and here's action. Uh, and in the traditional model between perception and action, there's this lots of mental states. But I want to say is that no, there's only this one mental state that mediates, uh, which is my head. Uh, is the, um, and, and these are these pragmatic representations. So this argument that you're referring to is where I'm trying to show that uh, these uh, pragmatic representations, you know, that represents the pen as having certain size properties, shape properties, and so on. They are, uh, they are perceptual states. And it's a bit of a complicated argument, so I'm not sure it, it's really going to, uh, to stick if I just want to talk about it, but it, it's about, uh, again, about uh, uh, an empirical result about how in some optical illusions, your eyes are deceived, but your, your motor action isn't. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so there's the famous illusion, it's called the Ebbinghaus illusion, where there's a circle that's surrounded by smaller circles. And there's, that's one of the displays. And then the other display is the circle of the same size, but it's surrounded by larger circles. So here is a circle surrounded by tiny circles, and here is another circle, same, same as this, but surrounded by these large circles. And you're going to see, so it's going to deceive your eye, it's an optical illusion, the circle that's no the circle that's surrounded by smaller circle is going to look bigger but when you have to just actually pick it up uh, then your uh, your grip size that you approach it with is not going to be fooled by this illusion so this is a reason to to somehow think that the action guiding perceptual system is somehow is is, is, is is guided by certain representations that are different from the conscious representations. So, um, and I want to say that these action guiding perceptual system, that's the one that the, the representations in that kind of system is exactly the one that kind of uh, gets you to, uh, to, uh, to guide your actions and you know, to, to pick up the pen and so on. Um, yeah, I can direct you to the chapter of the book that you want, that you might want to read if you're really interested in that. Sure. 
Thank you, Professor. And I want to ask you that how higher cognitive abilities might be grounded in sensory motor capacities. Um, so I'm not a fan of sens the, the term sensory motor. There are some theories that are uh, uh, use that term that I'm not not a fan of. But so the question is how the how co higher cognitive capacities are grounded in perception and action and interaction between perception and action. So one example that uh, that I think is a really important um, um, e example is um, is decision making. So decision, so decision making, and, and you know about big, huge questions. So here's a question: Should we go to uh, um, to study at university, or should you go and make a, make make money uh, instead? And you're trying to decide: Should I do this or should I do that? And and I think that part of the way you do this is uh, is by means of is, is with the help of imagination. So you imagine one scenario, and it's going to be very much a perceptual imagination. You imagine another scenario, you imagine yourself in one scenario, you imagine yourself in a different scenario, then you compare these two things. And this is a kind of a perceptual, imaginative process that you're doing. And it's not, although this is, seems to be a very high level decision task, it's really going to just depend on something, uh, something perceptual. So that's one, one way in which I, I think uh, higher, higher order stuff is depends on, on, on perceptual. Things. But I, uh, I'm, I'm writing a book on, on mental imagery um, and how mental imagery is, uh, is part of a number of our important cognitive um, achievements. And if you think of mental imagery as a perceptual process, which I do, then, uh, then, then that, that's going to be other examples for, for how perceptual stuff can explain higher level stuff. Okay. Thank you. Um, is it possible to trust our perception by depending on our empirical experiences with objects? Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, so whether you can tr trust our eyes? Um, I think so. I mean, um, uh, so, so here's, a, here's one way of phrasing, framing this. So, so um, when you have an experience, you don't really know whether it's a veridical experience or a hallucinatory experience, right? So, and, and uh, you know, philosophers often talk about hallucination as if it were just a kind of a theoretical possibility. It's not. Uh, if you look at the empirical stuff on hallucination, uh, we all hallucinate a lot. Even, you know, even healthy people, they hallucinate. Um, and some of these hallucinations are quite um, harmless. So one important, form of hallucination is um, apparently it's one of the most frequent one is that if you flush the toilet then you kind of hear noises that are not just a flush in the toilet maybe, maybe human noises that's something that people hear another um, important um, or kind of often reported hallucination and now that it's summer maybe it can something that you can uh, you can relate to is when you hear a mosquito buzzing although there is no mosquito so you're, you know that there's a mosquito in the room or you, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're afraid that there's a mosquito in the room and you're trying to sleep and then, and then you hear this kind of mosquito buzzing and, uh, but it turns out that there is no mosquito. So anyway, so you're trying to say that hallucination is not a, is, is not a trivial, it's not, it's, it's not just a theoretical possibility, hallucination is a, is a real thing. The question is whether you can, you can be sure that you're actually seeing something as opposed to hallucinating it. I think we have pretty good ways of figuring this out, right? I mean, if, if you're hallucinating something and then, uh, then you're trying to touch it and it's not there, then you, um, then you know that, it's, uh, that you were just hallucinating it. So we have uh, different ways of getting information from the world in terms of our different sense organs. And we see them, we hear them, we touch them and so on. And uh, and I think if you somehow if in doubt if you're in doubt about whether you can you can trust one of your senses, then you can then you have four others that you could uh, you could use to make sure. So I think uh, yeah, so that we have these ways of trusting our senses. Thank you. I'm um, I'm gonna ask you the last question. Uh, how can you explain the uncertainty of perception within the representations of the probability distributions? How can you explain the uncertainty of perceptions 
within the representations of probability distributions. Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's in a paper that was published just a couple of weeks ago. You guys are very uh, up on this. Um, so so I have this. So here's here's a big question about perception. Is it probabilistic or is it not probabilistic? Is it somehow uh, so when I uh, you know another summer night with mosquito uh, kind of uh, scenario. So you wake up in the middle of the night because there's a mosquito and you're um, and you're trying to go back to sleep, but it's dusk, so it's uh, it, it's kind of half darkness, and then you uh, you see the I don't know your lamp on on a uh, lampshade and it and it looks just kind of reddish and then it gets lighter and lighter so it gets uh, more some more uh, determinate color of red is this uh can this change as it gets lighter and lighter and your experience of your lampshade uh changes uh and can that be explained in a kind of probabilistic manner does it mean that somehow you attribute different probability to the lampshade and there's uh, there's a fairly new debate about this uh about what, what that tells us about the human mind, about the, the way human mind treats probability. And I want to say that it's not actually, you're not, you're not, it's not a probabilistic representation, but you just somehow attribute more, more or less determinate color to the lampshade. So the, the lighter it gets, the more determinate color you're attributing to the lampshade. And, um, and that, again, that's something that, um, that, that neuroscience and, and psychology can help us a lot with. So for example, when you're, uh, when I'm looking at you on the screen, then I have a fairly determinate representation of your face. But if I'm looking that way, looking that way, and you are in the periphery of my vision, then I have a very low determinacy representation of your of your face. So, for example, the the, the, skin, the skin tone of your uh, of your face, and so on. So, so again, this is something that we know from uh, from neuroscience and psychology that the depending on how you exercise your vision, there's gonna be very different determinacy of representation. And I think that we can use that framework to understand um, the probabilistic, what the, um, the seemingly probabilistic nature of perception. Okay, thank you. This was a great interview and thank you for your responses. Thank you for your questions.